All right. Welcome. Happy 2024, everyone. We're excited to have you here today. Uh, this is our 2023 tax wrap up and planning for 2024. We're excited for you to be here. I uh, have an all star cast today. Uh, Joel Chamberlain, founding partner and uh, individual, is going to be able to kick things off uh, with a tax update. From there, we're going to go to Isaac Brahinsky, who is also a partner here at FSA. And then finishing up strong is going to be Shelly Linger, our CEO and partner. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. We're going to go ahead and allow you to put questions down in the bottom of the chat here. We are going to be taking questions toward the end of the presentation. And uh, if you don't have any questions, feel free to just follow along and we're happy for you to be here. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Joel Chamberlain. Happy 2024, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining today. Uh, today, we're going to cover some tax updates and some items that we get uh, a lot of questions on throughout the year and hopefully get you uh, up to speed on your tax planning for uh, 2024. Yeah, so the first thing we're going to cover is some new tax credits uh, for this year. Uh, for those of you thinking of doing some energy efficient home improvements, uh, these are a thing again. So you have the opportunity to take some tax credits um, on your personal income tax. And a lot of the things that we look for, are like the um, air condition, windows, doors, things to increase the energy efficiency of your home. Uh, EV credits is another big hot uh, topic and we get a lot of calls on this and um, there's been some changes here and uh, for 2024 going forward. Uh, the thing to watch is really that modified adjusted gross income. So these credits are available um, either if you purchase or can get factored in if you're leasing as well. Um, but then you got to watch those income limits for many of our business owner um, tech tax clients, these limits may come into impact um, when considering this purchase. Uh, Form 1099s, we get a lot of questions about these. Uh, we all heard in the news recently about the IRS tracking our wanting information on payments over $600. Well, that got delayed. So for 2024, uh, the threshold is $5,000. However, there are some new rules for 2024 regarding 1099s that we're gonna cover in some detail. Uh, kind of the differences, we get a lot of questions. Do I do a, a 1099 NEC or do I do a 1099 MISC, and it really depends on what you're trying to report. What were these payments regarding? Were they uh, payments to independent contractors for services, or, um, which would go on the 1099 NEC, or were they more for rent or other miscellaneous healthcare payments or prizes or things that would go over the 1099 MISC? So just beware of those differences. We're here to help um, if you have any questions. Also, if you'd like to say we want you <laughs> to outsource this, we don't want to prepare our own 1099s. We offer those services for all of our clients, and you can easily sign up uh, at the top of our website. Um, one thing to note before going into this I didn't cover is the 1099s. Uh, are required to be electronically filed moving forward. So if you're issuing 1099s and think you could just run out at the last minute, grab some paper and get those out, uh, those days have changed. So uh, if you have any questions, we're here to help. Quarterly estimated tax payments is another common question we get. And there's a lot of complicated rules surrounding this. I think the uh, the most important one to be aware of is, is the safe harbor rules. And the safe harbor rules is either 90% of the current year's tax, or if your um, income has been exceeding, if your income for 2023 is a lot higher than the prior year, then you've got that 100% um, or 110% of the previous year's tax. Uh, also to note is that kind of how these fall. So these don't fall in the general calendar quarter. It's April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. Uh, this year was a little odd with Hurricane Idalia, so we actually have till February 15th this year, but this is the typical uh, schedule from the IRS. Um, a lot of our 
clients are asking us questions on what business expenses are deductible. And I think the first thing is, you know, ordinary and necessary. Um, and then how are you tracking those business expenses? Is it commingled with personal expenses? Do you have a separate bank account? Are you tracking them? Are you keeping good records? Those are all the types of things that we're advising and helping clients with throughout the year, um, just to avoid the, you know, the difficulty on any IRS audits. Uh, reimbursing yourself. So now that Schedule A has changed, you used to be able to deduct some business expenses on Schedule A on your personal return, uh, but that's no longer the case. So you want to make sure you get reimbursed um, by your business prior to year end. And it depends on whether you're an S Corp, C Corp, or LLC, kind of how that works. There's different kind of options there. And then also that you have an accountable plan. That, that's a document that allows your business to reimburse you for those certain types of expenses. Automobile expense is probably our number one question throughout the year. And it, as with everything with the IRS, it's always changing. Uh, the key with automobile expenses is knowing what's kind of a business expense, knowing what's a personal expense and knowing what's uh, commuting. So kind of factoring that in and we've, we've outlined some things here for you kind of on those drives that we can share with you. And then also, um, the difference between the standard deduction or taking the standard mileage rate or actually taking the actual expenses of the vehicle. So the standard mileage rate for 2023 was 65.5 cents per mile. And for 2024, it's up to 67 cents per mile. And both of these are um, either one taking the standard mileage or taking the actual expenses. It really comes down to that mileage, They're still tracking mileage. What was your business miles for the year? Some of the benefits of the actual expense method is depreciation. You can write that purchase cost of that vehicle off. Um, and then also, you know, gas, insurance, repairs, tires, those types of things. So really depends on what you're using the vehicle for in your business. The first threshold is really that 50% use threshold. Are you using the, the vehicle for more than 50% business purpose? If yes, then you have the kind of the option to look at either the standard mileage or the actual expense method. And we could advise you on kind of some of the nuances of that, how the vehicle is titled, um, what, what, where the vehicle is stored, those types of things. There's lots of complexities in this. Although technology is making a little bit easier, uh, Mileage IQ is an app that we recommend to clients and it kind of tracks your mileage behind the scene. So while you're driving um, and doing those drives, it's kind of tracking that for you. And then you can kind of swipe left and right, depending on if it's business or personal uh, mileage. Uh, depreciation, uh, some of the depreciation changes for the year. We've kind of got this outline and show, showing you that the although the thresholds are increasing, which is great for a lot of our business clients, the bonus depreciation um, has declined for 2023. It's now down to 80% instead of 100%, meaning you can't write off 100% of that equipment purchase, that asset purchase in the initial year. You can only take 80% now. And that's going to continue to decline um, based upon the current tax law. And we've got an, uh, a slide showing you that. So if you have some major purchases coming up in your business, you know, you may want to be wary of, does it make sense to accelerate those purchases? Are they going to increase the efficiency? Are we going to be more productive? Are we going to be um, more profitable in our business to go ahead and make those purchases and take advantage of some of these uh, depreciation numbers before they phase out? Um, Cost segregation study is another common question we get, and this is a lot for people that are purchasing real estate, either uh, residential real estate, commercial real estate, or even you know developers of real estate that find themselves holding on to real estate for um, as a rental asset in their portfolio. So a cost segregation study really helps you accelerate the different components of that building, breaking them down into different useful life, and then depreciating them 
in theory quicker than than just the standard depreciation method. Uh, the key here is we really recommend an engineering based cost segregation study to prevent uh, future issues. Passive activity losses. This is another common topic and planning uh, opportunity with clients. So um, if you have a, a loss, say in a um, uh, rental property or maybe in a startup business or just have a bad year in business, um, just kind of understanding those passive activity losses and how they can uh, offset some of your other ordinary income. So if you think of maybe uh, some rental properties you have, how does that um, impact like your W-2 compensation that you may have or your K-1 flow through income from your business? So um, understanding this is the key to proactive tax planning. Um, some of the factors really uh, come down to some, um, some tests and some questions. So it's really working through this with your CPA and your advisor here at our firm to kind of work through and make sure you understand these rules and that we're planning ahead for any potential losses and making sure we can take advantage of those. Uh, the annual gifting uh, limits have increased and as well as the estate and uh, gift tax exemption. Um, so the $17,000 2023 amount is now 18,000, which is great. And uh, the gift tax exemption is now up to 13.6 million, which, you know, we've had a lot of clients that we've talked to over the years about this, and they kind of haven't had this on their radar because they feel like they're not really um, near that 13.6 million amount. However, um, under the current tax law, these rules are set to sunset um, after 2025. So if essentially January 1st, 2026, the rules would sunset. And that 13.6 million amount uh, could be down to 6.2 million. Uh, so 6.2 million could affect a lot more of our clients, especially business owners that may have built up value in their business over the years. Uh, so we just rec highly recommend you uh, meet with us, meet with your estate planning attorney, and really talk about um, any things you need to do now proactively prior to January 1st, 2026. Um, that can impact your estate planning. Another very common question we get is S Corp versus LLC. And I'll, uh, I'll give you a little hint right now. There, there is no one size fits all answer. So it really depends on what you're doing in your business and what you're trying to accomplish for your family um, and your investments. So uh, we'd love to walk you through kind of some of the questions and rationale we go through to help our clients select the best structure, but taxation, ownership, management, and then kind of formalities and regulation and requirements all factor into those decisions. And then, you know, is this a long-term asset? What's the nature of the investment? Um, those types of things, understanding the tax implications, the liability protection, compliance. So there's, it's not an easy answer. Uh, Multi-state comes into factor. So um, uh, let us know if we can help you walk through this, not only for new businesses, but you may just want to say, hey, am I the right structure? My business has changed since I set up my original business, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Am I the right structure? Am I getting the, the best protection and the best tax benefits under my current structure? We'd be glad to help you with that. Well, thank you for allowing me to share today a little bit about taxation and some of the changes going on and answering some of the common questions. I'm going to turn it over to uh, my partner, Isaac, to go over the market update and 2024 outlook. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so uh, we want to look at what happened in, in Q4 of 2023, and then we want to look at uh, 2024 and what, what we might be seeing this year. Uh, so as we enter 2024, there's a, a host of market conditions that we want to keep our eyes on. Um, one of the biggest questions on people's minds and what you're probably hearing about a lot in the news is, are we going to get that soft landing that the Fed has been talking about? Um, and that really that everyone's been looking for, will they be able to produce that through their policies or are we going to see a recession in 2024? 
Uh, what we saw in the fourth quarter of 2023 was a lot of market indecision and volatility as people considered this question. So market prognosticators seem to change their minds almost monthly on what 2024 may look like, and we're pricing that in. So we'll take a look at where we ended December and what the outlook is moving forward. For a while now, we've been concerned with what interest rates are doing. When inflation started rising, the Fed took aggressive action to raise interest rates and try to slow rising prices. Um, but as you can see, we've had years where the Fed rate was basically bouncing off of zero. And so we've kind of gotten used to that. Uh, early on in the current cycle, the big question was how high the Fed would raise rates, how soon they would start going back to what we're used to, right? Going back to zero. But something not typical happened this time around. As the Fed increased rates, GDP continued to grow and unemployment remained stable. So now the question is, will the Fed drop rates as expected or will the current rate become the new normal for a while? The Fed rate, raising the rates, fighting inflation, generally there's a, an inverse relationship with unemployment there where it generally would cause unemployment to increase and could hurt the economy. So if the rates aren't significantly cut in 2024, how will it affect us? Uh, let's look at a couple other things here. One of the challenges we saw with inflation was a loss in real wages. Inflation outpaced wage growth, making it harder on families. But as inflation came down, wage growth has remained elevated. Um, and as wage growth begins to kind of stabilize, we'd probably see it come back to a level um, that, would, that would continue to outpace inflation in the short term. So this means there's room for normalization in the economy, even with these higher interest rates. Wages going back to outpacing inflation provides consumers with cushion to keep spending, which keeps the economy going. What about unemployment? So the Fed's mandate is to keep inflation under control and to keep the, uh, the economy at what economists consider full employment. So full employment doesn't mean that everybody always has a job all at the same time. Uh, but it does mean that if you don't have a job, it's really because you're in between jobs. And if you're seeking a job, you can find one. So often these two factors, like I said, are going to work uh, in, in, uh, against each other so that when the Fed is combating rising interest rate or rising inflation through interest rates, it causes unemployment to go up. In this case, we've seen unemployment stay steady as the Fed takes us through this inflation cycle. So this puts the Fed in a somewhat unique position of uh, actually being temporarily effective in meeting both of its mandates. Another thing that's kept the economy positive, even while the Fed beats up on inflation, is that consumers are still working through their way through significant personal savings that built up during, the, during COVID when people were prevented from shopping as much as they wanted to. So now we're finally seeing consumers get back to normal levels of spending and going back to what U.S. consumers do best, which is spend more than they make. I mentioned before how, you know, things seem to be changing monthly as far as how people feel about the economy and what they think about 2024. And we saw that with consumer sentiment. So consumer sentiment turned positive again at the end of 2023, but it continues to be volatile. The low point at the end of this chart was as recent as November. So the positive uptake is, uptake is great news, but the volatility is reflective of just how much there's this general feeling of uncertainty as we head into the new year. So let's talk about a couple of the headwinds that we're looking at and things that could slow us down in 24. Uh, one of the headwinds that we've seen is a significant drop in home affordability. High interest rates slowed the housing market, but didn't quite lead to a, a housing price recession. So as a result, home buyers are running into higher prices and higher costs of borrowing. So this is a definitely a red flag to be aware of. Uh, another potential economic headwind we face is growth of the national debt. The deficit ballooned during COVID as the government responded to severe economic threat to economic or threat to economic security. But in the years that followed COVID, uh, deficit spending has remained elevated. In the coming years, just the cost of servicing national debt could increase to more than the U.S. defense budget. The rate of debt growth is unsustainable. But to reduce the deficit, you generally have to do one of two things. You have to raise taxes or you have to cut spending. 
Since we're heading into an election year, we don't really anticipate either of those things happening. Um, I happened to pull up an article this morning, and it was talking about how Congress right now is debating a potential bill that they might make retroactive to 2023 uh, to renew higher child tax credits and restore R&D expensing. So those would be two big tax cuts, and the two sides, that's the pieces that they're bringing to the negotiating table. One wants to cut taxes in one area, the other one wants to cut taxes in the other area. So when it comes to national debt, I think we're going to see this continue to grow uh, at the pace that it has been, at least through this election year. So let's take a moment and talk about business cycles. In normal business cycles, the economy is going to expand, contract, recover, and expand again. This is all part of that natural search for equilibrium in the market as prices test upper limits and supplies go back and forth from surplus to deficit. If you have a surplus, generally you're going to cut prices in order to get through that. If you have a deficit in, uh, in supplies, then you're going to raise prices. Um, when we, we, so we get this slide here from Fidelity, and it shows that in the fourth quarter, they see the U.S. economy as very late cycle uh, heading towards a potential recession. And they show that Europe uh, is really already there and China is moving towards recovery. This is why many market observers are, are planning on and thinking there's going to be interest rate cuts in 2024. But what if the Fed gets the soft landing that they want? What if we skip that major contraction and move right to recovery? In reality, we probably won't know the answer. And if we did that until we were on the other side of it, looking back. So when we're going into 2024, these are going to be the major factors that, that drive the economy. Some market watches interest rates breathlessly. Companies continue to turn out profits and reward their investors. So regardless of what happens, the economy grows when companies produce and make money. Unemployment has stayed stable during the interest rate hikes. The questions remain of whether that wage growth will stabilize and if unemployment will eventually increase with the higher interest rates. As I said before, the presidential elections are always messy. No doubt we'll hear from both sides plenty of gloom and doom about you know, what has already happened if you stick with one guy and what could happen if you go with the other. So uh, we're going we're gonna to have that uh, uh, assaulting our ears throughout this next year. Uh, the nat national debt is eventually going to force the hand of politicians. We likely won't see anything done this year to address the national debt, but eventually it is going to need to be addressed. Consumer sentiment and spending has been volatile. It could re result in a drop in spending or continued consumer strength as inflation comes under control could drive long-term growth. And then of course, there's the Fed. Steady Fed rates have been historically good for the market, even if they're elevated. And they give Fed cushion to act in case of a recession. But we could see turbulence if the priced in Fed cuts don't happen or if inflation rears its ugly head again. So soft landing versus recession. What happens in either case? Uh, let's take a look at the soft landing. Well, what do we get? With the soft landing, we might get a normalization of inflation. We might get consumer price stability. Uh, but with interest rate cuts already priced in, that could also lead to a market correction from December highs. A correction is a drop of 10% off of market highs and actually on average occurs about once a year historically. The other problem is that a soft landing could bring the, the risk of a return to an inflationary environment. In the short term, the result could likely be short-term volatility. So what about a recession? Could it finally loosen the labor market? Could it lead to interest rate cuts? The market likes interest rate cuts in the very short term. Uh, but what if it's accompanied by deflation? If you have a recession, you're going to have a GDP drop, and that usually increases unemployment. So a recession could certainly lead to short-term volatility as well. So what do you do in a world of uncertainty and volatility? Whether it's a bull market or a bear market, recession or recovery, short-term volatility is very normal. The market on average has about 5-2% drops each year. Uh, but historically, we've seen the S&P 500 overcome short-term losses in the long term. If your savings are losing to inflation, 
then you aren't really saving, are you? Uh, you know, we've seen, and this is the importance of having a diversified portfolio. In 2022, the big winner was U.S. Treasuries uh, coming in with returns of about one and a half percent, but versus nine percent inflation. So the key is to make a plan and to stick to it and not let short-term market volatility scare you out of your long-term plan. There's always going to be reasons to be shy about investing in the U.S. economy, but historically, spending less than you make, investing the difference in a well-diversified portfolio has helped people who stick to their long-term financial plan more than trying to time the market or you know, discover those winners. So the best option for 2024 probably sounds like a broken record, but make a plan, stick to it, have a diversified portfolio that doesn't put all your eggs in one basket, turn off the TV, and don't let short-term fear derail your long-term plans. Okay, so you're ready to do your long-term planning. You're ready to fund your retirement. Um, I always say that there are three things that are certain in life, death, taxes, and we're all going to have to retire someday. Um, so let's look at some of the new co retirement contribution limits that are coming for 2024. Uh, for your 401k, you can defer up to $23,000 now with a $7,500 catch-up if you're over age 50. Uh, if you do an IRA contribution, then it's $7,000 with a $1,000 catch-up. Simple plan will let you do $16,000 with a $3,500 catch-up. And then total combined contribution limit, so that's employer and employee contributions to a 401k, will get you up to $69,000. So if you have your own business, you have a 401k, and you want to look at doing a profit sharing plan, uh, that's how much you could do for yourself individually through that 401k. And then, of course, you know, have to take into account what you contribute to your employees as well with a profit sharing plan. Another opportunity would be a cash balance pension which is treated very much like a 401k when it comes to the tax deduction um, and contributing and, and a lot of those same rules, except you're able to contribute a whole lot more than just a profit sharing amount. So for the right candidate in the right circumstance, that could be an option to look at. And then this last one, the RMD QCD limit is raised to $105,000. So what is an RMD QCD? Well, an RMD is a required minimum distribution that you may be taking already if you've reached that age or you may, may have to start taking. And every year, basically, if you have a tax deferred IRA or 401k, you're going to have to start drawing funds out of it because the, the IRS gave you your tax deferral. Now they want their taxable income. Uh, but one of the things that you can do is a qualified charitable distribution. And so what this means is that you can take up to $105,000 from your IRA and you can send it directly to a qualified charitable organization. If it comes to you first and then goes to them, it doesn't count. It has to go directly to them. But what this does is that uh, charitable contribution now avoids all of the limitations that you have with itemized deductions, um, you know, with trying to get over the, the, uh, the pretty generous standard deduction that we have right now. Um, and so instead, it comes directly off of that IRA RMD distribution income if you send it directly to the charity. Um, so definitely get with your advisor before you take that RMD. And if you have a charity in mind, and maybe it's just your church and you give every week at your church, if you do it through your required minimum distribution instead, that can be a significant tax savings for you. So that's pretty much it for the, uh, the Q4 and 2024 market update. And now we're going to have Shelly come and uh, give us the trends in client advisory services. intro and there we go thank you isaac i appreciate that intro all right so we're talking about account accounting industry news so i think one of the big points is um intuit which owns quickbooks announced that they will not be selling new new desktop subscriptions after july 31st 2024 importance here is the word new um they will continue to support um, the 2024 version, um, in, if you already have it, um, they'll continue to update the 2024 version. 
<clears throat> but just like the yearly discontinued support of older versions of QuickBooks desktop products, this year they will discontinue support of the uh, QuickBooks desktop 2021 version. Uh, what does that mean for your desktop products? I would say the writing is pretty much on the wall and you have a max of three years before it can go, com go away completely. Um, that is what the industry buzz is talking about. Several um, leaders in the technology and industry and accounting industry have said that um, several times. QuickBooks Online, no worries there. Everything is going to be the same. Um, I think this is just into its way of shifting everybody to an online platform. Um, as far as the 2021 version being discontinued, which means Intuit will no longer support it. That means if something happens to your file, it gets corrupt, Intuit or uh, QuickBooks is not going to be doing anything about it. And again, this is in the desktop version. Um, so we recommend, we highly recommend um, that you either update to the 2024 version so that you have that for a couple more years, or take the leap of faith and go to the online, the QuickBooks online or zero. Zero is another great um, accounting uh, software. All right, so speaking of cloud software and cloud accounting, but we here at Financial Solution Advisor support uh, many, many different types for any size business. We support Zero and QBO for that smaller business. We uh, we have um, Intact and NetSuite for the larger businesses, which um, we're, we're seeing more and more of come through. There is also so many amazing applications. This is what I love that you can plug and play into your current accounting software, which really lets you customize your accounting needs for your business. We don't have to go with more robust accounting systems to get one or two features. You can actually um, take an application that can do can do that for you. For example, um, expense reimbursement, there's an application that we can connect to your current accounting software to make that easier. And so you don't have to upgrade. Um, so great features out there. Um, I encourage you if you have any questions to reach out to us and let us know. Speaking of features, I am excited to announce that Financial Solution Advisors is rolling out a new advanced offering for our client advisory services. We are so excited about this. Today's consumers don't want one size fits all financial advice. We get that. We've heard you. They desire personalized service that speaks to their unique needs and goals. By leveraging AI in data analytics, we can offer customer, customized advice and predictions tailored to your specific need in your business. Our new offering builds dynamic budgets, forecasting, and multiple scenario plans analyzing changes in your business so that you can stay on track. We can deliver hindsight, insight, and foresight all in one. We go above and beyond Excel and have created a dynamic tool for your business. This offering can be done on a monthly, weekly, quarterly, or custom timeframe for your company. If you are interested in this service, please reach out to us as many clients are asking and signing up for this that you, so that you don't have to be put on a waiting list. What a great way to start your 2024 um, business on the right track um, using this tool. So we are going to um, show a little example of what this tool can do. Yes, so it can do anything. It The presentation, you can do all kinds of stats. The presentation, especially on a board meeting or something, can look amazing. And this can all be customized for you. Um, if you're looking for investors for your company, this is also an amazing tool um, that we can work with you to set up, customize for your clients. So we're really excited about this. If you have any questions, again, reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to answer any of those questions.
Perfect. Thank you, Shelly. And thank you for everyone participating there. Got a few questions in about 10 minutes left here. Remember, if you have questions for the group, please put them down in the Q&A. Uh, the first one here is going to be for Joel, and it's pertaining to automobile depreciation. So uh, when talking about automobile depreciation, actual expense method, is that for business or personal autos as well? Yeah, those are just business autos to so take the um, actual expenses and you'll want to do that. It may be if you had a Schedule C and not an LLC or S Corp, the auto could be in your personal name, but we want to talk through that. So I would say um, schedule a time to uh, reach out to your CPA here that you're working with, and we can go through those rules for your situation. Okay, perfect. Joel, and uh, you are the popular individual here. I have another one for you. What's required in an accountable plan for reimbursing yourself for business expenses? Yeah, I think we can give you a sample accountable plan as well if you if you shoot us an email. But it's just basically a uh, a document that your company adopts that that kind of outlines how you are re uh, reimbursed for expenses, um, and then the the manner of that. Right, you don't want someone showing up with a uh, expense from ten years ago and trying to get reimbursed. So usually you set some time limits, you set a frequency, and it's kind of a plan document that uh, kind of protects the company as well as allows you to get deduction for these expenses. Beautiful. And uh, shifting gears to 1099s. Uh, so do 1099s need to be sent to service providers, uh, meaning accountants, when the uh, paid the service provider by card? Um, yes, 1099s are required, whether you pay by credit card or check or um, a payment system like Zelle. Um, so 1099s are still required. Um, it depends on the service provider. Um, for example, if they have a, uh, an, a corporation, generally they're exempt from 1099s. However, there are certain nuances. So not every corporation. Law firms, for example, uh, require 1099s requ regardless of the structure. So uh, there's a lot of nuances. Um, I'd say follow that link on our website and uh, one of our professionals uh, will get with you and can uh, make sure that you're meeting those requirements for your business. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, just a few more here. So uh, I have an LLC and change it to an S Corp. Can I change that back at a later date? Yes, you can. You have to meet certain requirements, though, and there's only there's certain times you can uh, change back. Um, and there's some, some windows of opportunity, let's say. So uh, you have a certain number of times you can change and then a window of how often you can change. So uh, we'd want to talk that through with you and understand what you're trying to accomplish. Sometimes it may not you may not need to change as, as long as we know what you're trying to accomplish, but we can help you um, through those details. Okay, perfect. Then uh, I'll give you a break here, Joel, and punt this over to Isaac for the last question. So regarding retirement, are there any other options for 401k if you want to exceed the $69,000 uh, contribution amount? Yeah, so not for the 401k itself, because that's going to give you that, that upper limit of you know, what you can contribute and what your employer can contribute and uh, what can be contributed on your behalf through the profit sharing plan. Um, but that's where if you're in a situation like that, where you have, um, uh, you know, a lot of additional cash at the end of the year, and you're looking at a, a really a high income year, and especially, you know, really, if you're looking at you're going to have several years where you're experiencing this high income, you have a lot of cash at the end of the year. Um, and especially if you really want to do something for uh, retaining your employees, that's an op that's a time that we'd want to look at that cash balance option, where you could definitely set aside uh, much higher than that just 401k and profit sharing limit. You know, the 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 big drawback of that is you don't want to do it just because you had one good year. You want to do that as an option where you've had uh, or where you're expecting multiple good years um, as a as a pension, even though uh, the mechanics of it work a lot of the, the same way as a 401k as a pension, it's, you know, a lot more uh, difficult to get uh, up and running. And then when it comes time to wind it down, again, a lot more paperwork, a lot more uh, work goes into that. All right. Thank you, Isaac. So uh, we're, we're coming up on time here. Just want to thank everyone again for joining us. 
and uh, point out a few things. You know, we are putting blog articles out uh, every week. So if you have not checked out the website, please go to FSA cpas backslash blog a lot of this information we covered today is captured and expanded upon in those blogs really great information uh, if you want to be notified on this you can actually follow us on social media as well we have a linkedin and facebook presence and you could also call us at our offices or shoot us an email if you have an existing relationship uh, again thank you so much joel shelley isaac for providing a lot of really good information heading into 2024 and we look forward to serving you as the year goes on Thank you, everyone.